Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Very excited. Today we have Sam Markowitz, who's a top copywriter and direct response marketer. He's known as Gary Halbert's last protege. He creates multimedia marketing campaigns that make his clients tens of millions of dollars. And before the age of 30, his work had already made a client over $100 million online. Today, Sam runs the Sam Markowitz Group with a heavy focus on marketing consulting, mass market advertising, and direct response brand building. We're lucky to have Sam for many reasons, and especially he keeps a very low profile. Sam, thanks for joining me. I'm glad to be here. Excited. You know, I always like to include a fun fact uh, about people. And fun fact, two fun facts, you know, which I want to ask about is you used to be a gymnast for seven years. So I want to hear how the discipline, you know, kind of goes into and sinks into your everyday life. And also the low profile that I mentioned. You know, I do a lot of research ahead of time and I could find about four pages online about you. <laughs> so what's yeah. the reason? Uh, so talk about the the low profile yeah, first. Yeah, talk about the low profile. To be online, yeah. sure. Um, well, I mean, I'm not on I'm not I'm not in social media. Uh, main reason is I, you know, I'm a trained writer, and I spend a lot of time with my laptop, and we have a very good relationship, and so I need time away from it, and that was a key initial reason for not wanting. <clears throat> to be on social media, essentially. Mm -hmm. And number two, I really like um, live interaction with people. And I, I feel it's more meaningful when it's live, even though I have less interactions with people. Um, and I feel social media tends to reduce the significance and meaningfulness of interaction. So I, I have many reasons I could go on and on about it. Mm -hmm. That's essentially why I'm not online in that regard. Yeah. yeah. So what about the discipline? Tell me about being a gymnast. And you have to be pretty disciplined. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I did that for seven years about. Um, that was when I was little. Um, my mom pushed me into it reluctantly. I did not want to go into gymnastics, um, but I have Ukrainian parents and it's one of the things you kind of end up doing. Um, it's one of a few options. But she really did it because I was very shy, to be frank with you, when I was hmm. little. And she thought it would be a way to open me up and... Uh, and I did a lot of performing too. I used to perform at like restaurants. I was what kind of performing? Um, gymnastics oh. type stuff. Like I had a little troupe. Um, my my trainer was a former Olympic like trainer um, back in Russia. Um, so I was learning some serious gymnastics, and we had like a little group, and we go to all the Russian restaurants in Brooklyn, New York, and we'd have performances there, and I was on Russian TV one time doing <laughs> a performance, and performed at Lincoln Center, which was actually a highlight when I was a little kid, um, so it, it was it was great in the sense of discipline, um, I I never had structure and discipline in my life in that regard, to that extreme, and that's it, pretty extreme discipline from what I hear. It is. It, it is. It's extreme discipline. Um, it's it's great um, in terms of just a sport. It's actually great for your body. Um, I probably have my kids doing it because you're really doing, you know, you're incorporating endurance, strength training, um, flexibility, all kind of combined into your workouts and and what you're doing. And it's uh, it's really great for many reasons. So, so what about discipline you know. in your writing? What is your daily writing routine? Because you don't do social media. You seem no. like you're very disciplined. Tell me about your your daily routine. Daily routine. Um, okay. Well, specifically for writing or yeah for just, writing yeah yeah um well everyone different writers have their own kind of process to get into writing and a lot mm. of people have certain routines they do i i don't have much of that basically i i don't I'll, I tried writing first thing in the morning before I no longer do i have a whole routine before i get to the actual writing and working what do you do uh, i so first thing in the morning, well, to really go like through all of it. So first thing in the morning, I spend about an hour, hour and a half actually 
Um, this is something I started incorporating this year more so on, on spirituality um, and personal growth, mm -hmm. um, education and things of that sort. Yeah. Then, so I work on that first thing. Then I work on my physical body. So I work out. I still do gymnastics. I still do my handstands and really? things like that I practice. Yep. Um, it's funny how it's like learning to ride a bicycle. Um, you don't... <clears throat> You don't actually forget a lot of that. Um, mm. If you don't do flips and stuff for a while, the fear <laughs> builds in of doing it. Um, but you could quickly like retrain yourself to do it. Um, so I do a little bit of, of that, and then I do I do a mental warm up, um, which is actually something a lot of writers do. Um, Eugene Schwartz actually um, used to do math problems for about an hour really? before he did any writing. Um, yeah. Um, so it, different writers have different ways yeah. to do it. I will read the newspaper for a half an hour. I'll read books. I'll, I'll do something to stimulate myself mentally. Um, and after that point, I'll usually start my work day. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm having trouble for whatever reason getting into the groove of writing, um, a lot of people ask me about that. So some things that they do is uh, comedy. I'll turn on some George Carlin tapes or mm. listen to some comedy. Um, because a lot of that really is about just opening up the creative process in those sure. channels. So I'll listen to some of my favorite comedians. Mm. So who are your favorites? Um, so I, I listen to a lot of George Carlin. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually, my little brother just gifted me um, a set of uh, the complete set of Calvin and Hobbes. And I used to read that when I was when I was young, and it's one of my favorite uh, nice. favorite cartoons of all time. So I, I actually began rereading that now, and I, I absolutely love that. Um, I like all sorts of comedy, to be honest with you. Yeah. Uh, I go in all sorts of scopes, but um, so that helps. Um, fatigue, believe it or not, helps a lot in the writing and creative process. Really? So sometimes it's just a matter of going at it for a long time until you're dead tired. And often I'll start loosening up and the really creative stuff will happen when I'm very tired. Um, so it's about pulling through sometimes in that regard. Um, most of the time I you know, I, I work a lot, so I don't really have stumbling blocks. Um, but they do come up once in a while and I'll resort to to methods like that yeah 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 and you know sam i also mentioned obviously in the in the intro about making a client a hundred million dollars that's that's remarkable yeah you know so is that something you expected going in when you took this client yeah. on did you think you know, i'm gonna make this person a hundred million dollars what were your thoughts at the time no my thoughts at the time is i'm going to write a really killer ad uh, <laughs> it's really where that began um, and that took off in that direction for many reasons. Um, in yeah. retrospect, what I did there, I did a lot of smart things that I didn't realize I did then, and I could only look back and realize what I've done. Mm -hmm. Um, but definitely didn't expect it. That's for sure. Yeah. So what were some of the things you did that worked? Um, I'd say there were, uh, there were a few elements to, to why that was so successful. Um, one of the elements was was simply that it was I took a very mass appeal approach. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the client actually approached me with a few options um, for what to do, and I chose what I thought was the best out of them. Um, and it, so one secret was definitely mass appeal. I mean, if you want to make big money, the bigger the market, the better. And I basically chose a market that is almost everybody in that regard, mm -hmm. um, to a large degree. Um, and I wrote the ad in a way where I was able to appeal to really mass America in a massive way. I mean, the thing would work cold to almost any list, any mm -hmm. traffic source we tested. Um, and that is a, it's a difficult thing to pull off in a number of regards, um, but it's pull offable if you intend to do it and you specifically target very mass market. So I say mass appeal was one of the keys. Mm -hmm. Two is um, probably hitting, I really hit the nail on the head there. So I, the best way to, to explain what I mean by that is I'll, I'll give you a, you know, all right, I'll tell you this. Gary Halbert had a story that he, he would tell all the time and not all the time, but he, he's told it before. And, illustrates this point. So he gives an example of a really gorgeous girl 
um, sitting in a bar. I mean, a beautiful, I mean, you know, just think like supermodel like woman, you know. And so it's a fancy party. There's a lot of successful guys there. And so they all try going up to her to hit on her. So, you know, one guy walks up to her and he's, he's like a celebrity, you know, and he starts telling her about all the parties he's hanging out at and all the celebrities. And she's just not interested, not having it. Another guy walks up to her and he's, he's a billionaire, you know, so he's telling her about the mega yacht that he was just sailing on. And, and all this stuff and just nothing, not impressing her. You know, another guy walks up to her and this guy is the most handsome guy at the party. I mean, one of the most handsome people on earth, you know, and uh, just would sway any woman. Everyone's melting around him. He goes up to her. She just is not having it. And then finally, all of a sudden, this kind of average chump, guy who's broke, not good looking, not famous, nothing, just goes up to her and he whispers something in her ear. And within a few seconds after doing so, she leaves with him, walks out of the party with this guy. And everyone around is wondering, what just happened? You know, how did this, like, schmuck walk out of the party with this girl? You know, I mean, what? so, and the secret is that is what he whispered in her ear. And what he whispered in her ear is, hey, I've got some blow. Want a party? So... <laughs> He knew that this girl loves cocaine and she's into cocaine. And so that was her hot button. And so he dropped that on her and walked out. Now, the lesson of that story is... Carry cocaine. No, take, I'm just kidding. Right. Well, <laughs> no, I'm not, this is not an advertising for cocaine. I don't do drugs. I, right. I you know, um, it's not what that's about. But the lesson there is... Uh, is you know, most people would, would make assumptions about how to get that girl, you know, I mean, and you would make these mass assumptions, you know, looks, money, celebrity, etc. And if you don't have the information to, you know, to make a decision, you're going to make what the best assumptions you can. But this guy had research and knowledge that no one else had about what is her actual hot button. Right, right. And that's exactly what he used, and that's what won. And I'd say the secret to the success of that ad was was the same. Um, you know, I really did my homework in that mm -hmm. regard to figure out what are the hot buttons in this particular case yeah. that will make the sale happen. And I've that was probably you know the second secret to to the success of that. Um, mm -hmm. There's many more, but those would be the biggest ones. Yeah, give me one more. But before you before you give me one more, I want to talk about the hot button for a second. You know, obviously you may need to keep this client confidential you may need to keep the market confidential i don't know how confidential you need to keep it but um what were some of the hot buttons you found or how did you end up doing the research because it's you know you it's not as easy as you know you probably did a lot of research you have certain methods to your research how did you end up finding those hot buttons i'd say this um you know if you want another secret yeah. there it's 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 working my ass off um, right. would, be, would be the you know um, as as Gary Bensavenga says, research is like his secret. Um, mm -hmm. That really is um, you know one of the big secrets there. Um, I I've taken that market and you know my research process when I enter into a market if I'm going to really get into it is um, number one I'll study everything in that market. Um, I will get every print advertisement in that market. I'll get every infomercial. I'll get everything that ran in the newspapers. I have ways of doing that. Everything that ran in direct mail. Everything that ran not only recently but throughout history back you know um, to the early 1900s to whenever I can. I will talk to everyone I can. I will go full force with home. Mm -hmm. And it's only through that process of really doing a lot of work that you're able to kind of figure those things out. Um, and, you know, it, it, it really comes down to that. I mean, that's the answer. Yeah. Sure. If, if you want somebody that you could apply to anything, it's the more homework you do, the more you could figure that out. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and then what ends up happening, though, is after doing that research, you find a number of different things that can appeal to people, like yeah. in that market segment. So it's about then figuring out what is the number one thing, um, you know, the top three and then the number one. Mm -hmm. And that takes a lot of prodding and, and really like digging in in different ways to figure that out. Gary Halbert's secret to success um, you know, he was able to beat so many copywriters um, all the time. 
and without doing anywhere near the work that most other people would do, frankly. And what I, what, well, what I'll say with that is he did the work early on, but in his later years he didn't have to do work. The reason is because for so many markets he just knew what the number one hot buttons are in so many right. markets because he's been there already, right. that he'd be able to go and just write an ad instantly around that hot button and win. Right. Um, that just it's really a key secret and it comes to really doing a lot of research and homework. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And with that one, the obvious question, obviously, which you may not be able to share is what was the hot button or if not, what, what industry, what would be an example of an industry that maybe you're not in that would be like the number one hot button? Look, you know, I'll give you, so I could give you a, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, and it's, you know, it's a little tough for me to share with you really proprietary information. For sure, I'm, yeah. I'm I mean, you, know, you know how it goes. My mind goes directly to ask, well, ask, what was the hot button? What you know? But I'll give you yeah. an example of like, all right, let's take skincare. Um, I I've been doing a lot of work in skincare for a while, um, and one thing that I can share with you is that if you're going to if you're going to target and you want to go as like a front end product and you want to go really broad, um, wrinkles are probably the best thing to target in terms of all the options that you have to target. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd say, you know, number one, you'd want to know that about picking out a problem. Um, another like insight is instant gratification versus having to wait for a long time. So mm -hmm. the more instant you can make gratification, the better. Um, I, you know, I, I think I've showed you uh, an ad there yes. recently, and I'll share. I can't share with you the headline, or, or but I will share with you a concept that I use, yeah. which is knowing that people want to see quick results. I came up, and it's selling a cream that does have an effect where you actually it does actually hide the appearance of wrinkles instantly. Right. But I didn't want to use instantly either because instantly can be not very believable at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so even though it is an instant result, I came up with the hook of you see the result within 17 seconds. Right. And 17 seconds is a very specific number. Mm -hmm. um, a lot more believable than instant, but yet in that instant gratification range. You know, it, Another thing to note in that market is that the women that can afford to buy, say, high-end creams tend to be older. Um, the hot core of that market is older. And in fact, the age keeps increasing. Um, as as boomers keep aging, um, so it, these are examples of like yeah. insights there. Um, yeah, and many more. Um, but these are the type of things that you'd want to know going into a market yeah. and choosing what message to put out there. Yeah, yeah. and that's huge because. I, I often wouldn't automatically think, oh, go to instant gratification, but that is such a key thing. So I'm glad you pointed that out. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, Sam, you know, since I do a lot of research on guests ahead of time, and I only had a couple pages for you, so I scoured through these pages. And um, one of the things sure. I thought was interesting um, is so you list five main ways to grow your business on your sites. And number five on your site, you mention, uncovering the hidden opportunities. Mm. So I want to hear a little bit about some of your favorites throughout the years, what you can share, and maybe one that blew you away. One blue, I'm sorry, not blew you away, but blew your client away that you were able to kind of instantly, or maybe not even instantly, but give them some of the hidden opportunities. Sure. So that's a very, that's a very big topic, I'll say. Um, and it's very specific to every business, yeah. what you will uncover in a business. But I'll give you, I'll say this. So first, a lot of people know me as a copywriter. And while I am very well trained as a copywriter, and that's the reason I went to mentor under Gary, um, I don't consider myself a copywriter first and foremost. Um, I really consider myself an entrepreneur and uh a marketing strategist essentially yeah. um, and the copywriting is something I learned because I saw that as an essential skill in the mix that will enhance everything I do to a great degree yeah. so um, I look at a business in its entirety um, and 
after Gary, I started working with a lot of direct response companies, obviously. And, you know, most direct response companies are very focused in certain things. Um, so, number one, most um, tend to operate, a lot of direct response guys tend to operate in one medium. You have, like, the online guys, you know, with online businesses. You have direct mail guys. You've got, like, the TV guys, you know. Um, very rare do yeah. you see guys that really operate in multimedia. Um, in fact, in the reverse, because I also, you know, do some more so consulting with like corporate, um, you see them operating in multimedia. However, they don't have the skills to actually do the direct, you know, do those media as well as they can. So they have the reverse problem. Um, but so number one, um, I'm able to close the gap in both ends of the extreme for a lot of people you know mm -hmm. most so with the direct response guys would come to me and say hey you know I'm like I've got this online you know campaign like help me make it better and little do they see like what they could really do with that um, if they were to go beyond that mm -hmm. uh, so there's plenty that you could do with that but plenty that you could go beyond that and you know and I mean it's kind of it's expansive to to go into it um, but so that I'd say that in terms of specific examples, I mean, they're, they're really many. Um, what are some of your favorites throughout the years that you uncovered? Um, you know, it's a lot of it. A lot of it really comes down to most of what I will do with people in that regard is, is putting them into, um, into new so distribution channels for example here's here's an example that I like a lot a lot of people have a distribution channel um, say guys in retailer etc um, and what they don't realize is the value that they could bring to someone else um, who is got a product and is looking for a distribution channel but is not able to like get one or is having trouble you know getting one a lot of those guys that have distribution don't realize they could do a JV and basically take a big percentage of someone else's business by helping them put that product through that distribution channel um, so I've done a number of times I've orchestrated helping deals like that which is a very big win-win for both sides a lot of people miss opportunities there um, also in terms of distribution so um, in skincare, um, I've worked. I primarily work with one company for about uh, that I've built for about three years or so. Um, and so we we had a distribution channel. We started um, selling a product through spas, um, something a lot of people miss, um, and it became a very significant uh, you know piece of our business. Um, something a lot of people just don't think about um, in this space. I mean, there's, there's endless examples. Um, I, I don't really know. I mean, there's, there's really plenty of them in that What's regard. another one that comes to mind? I could listen to your examples probably for the next three hours, but I'll, what's, uh, what's another one that comes to mind uh, for you know, uncovering those hidden, you know, those hidden things that people are not doing that are low-hanging fruit? That are low-hanging fruit. Yeah. Um, so, I'd say, okay. So, low-hanging fruit. Um, one thing that I'd say that a lot of people miss as well, um, and this is actually something within their advertising, is um, is story. So it's amazing how much um, I'll talk to someone and uncover a story within their business. From one of the creators or someone, you know, in any regard that they're just not using anywhere. Um, and I add that into the business and it just, it explodes the business. Um, that's something that really people have that's an asset mm -hmm. that a lot of people do not realize they have um, and make nothing with. Um, so that would be another cool example that most people could use. Um, I mean, there's, you know, my do any mind. any stories uh, stick out to you? Any that you couldn't believe that they didn't think to put this in their marketing? That it's just so, just an amazing story. Yeah, I, again, you I, can't share it. 
I, I can share some yeah. of them, but it's yeah. remarkable how we're digging because people don't see the value of their stories there yeah. unless they're yeah. interviewed for a few hours to get that out of them. Um, mm -hmm. And then plastering that all over the place. Personality, actually, as well um, in advertising is something that people miss in general and don't do. If you look at Gary's newsletters, um, you know, his personality shines through tremendously. And I can't really think of many people that are able to mimic that. Um, but yeah. the more you could do that, the more you stand out tremendously. Yeah. And it's a very valuable asset. And then you could use the personality as much as like the business. I mean, the personality could be a very big driver to the brand itself. Um, yeah. How about this, Sam? So what are some of the questions that you ask to help get to that story? Because, you know, that's a, a key skill. And I noticed when we talked previously, you ask really good questions. Sure. Um, I actually have like files of questions. Um, and depending on scenarios, I, I'd have to pull it up. Yeah. But, uh, but so number one is I'll, I'll interview everyone that I possibly can at the company. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I begin with like when they were born. Um, and really? I go through, yeah, <laughs> like literally, um, and I go through their whole life. I mean, I'll spend like a few hours talking to someone about like all their life stories and everything. And it's amazing mm. how you'll connect this and that and that and that and, and be able to pull together, you know, a lot of interesting facts and stories about people. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll do that process with, you know, all the co-founders. Um, if it's a product where someone invented something, the people in, involved in the invention of it, you know, the scientists, the um, if they're bringing on a celebrity on board, I want to know everything about the celebrity, etc. I mean, it's about getting that, and um, there's a lot of gold there that a lot of people miss. That's highly, highly leverageable. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. then, kind of transitioning to you, um, mm -hmm. where'd you grow up? Tell me about your you early on. Sure. Um, so I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Um, where should I go with this? I, yeah. Well, this is kind of a very long story. I guess, you know, what's something that was a big influence for you growing up that you remember that you think back on? Sure. Um, so my, I'd say this, I think, I, you know, you know this, but I, I come from a very entrepreneurial background yeah. and um, my... My dad has actually been a very huge influence on me, my life, um, the direction I take in, in general. Um, and when I was very little, I have rough memories of this, but my dad was very successful. Um, he moved to New York in 79 and um, from Ukraine, and he was very successful in Ukraine. Uh, there's a long story to that yeah. because it was the Soviet Union and you weren't um, allowed to actually operate business. But he was living in the in the mountains, the Carpathian Mountains, and it was a bit more lax, and you were able to get away with a lot more things out mm. there. Um, and so, my dad and my grandpa actually had businesses. What um, they do? All sorts of things. Um, my dad, for a while, uh, for my grandpa, ran a ran a winery. Um, so he was making wine and um, all sorts of businesses. And so they, they did very, very well and had a lot of money in an environment where people all had the same amount of money. Um, and, you know, and my dad came to the United States. Um, eventually, they literally, even though they made so much money, it came to a point where things got a bit scary um, and they had to put whatever they can in suitcases and, and leave is what it came to. Um, but my dad still managed to come back to the United States with a good amount of money and um, was looking into a number of businesses to go into. He's had an art business. He's an art dealer, actually, for mm. the last, uh, no, it's been two, three decades. Um, but when he first came to the United States, he decided to get into another business um, and buy a gas station. And long story short, um, he, was, he was cheated um, in, that bus in the business that he bought there, um, mm. gas station. Uh, cheated by the guys that sold it to him. And even his lawyer uh, was involved in the whole scam. Wow. And it turned out that uh, the gas station owned, owed about, I forget it was, I believe, uh, about one or two million dollars in taxes Jeez. that 
they managed to hide from my dad, even my dad's lawyer, like his lawyer, like was involved in this whole thing. And so my dad ended up buying the business, which cost a chunk of money. And then a few months later, he gets a notice from the IRS for the back taxes. And in the early 1980s, my dad just came to this country. We're talking about a lot of, that's a lot of money. And so it's a lot dad, of money for anyone. Yeah, of course. Yes, yeah. For anybody. Especially, but especially, you know, then yeah. that scenario. And long story short, um, you know, that put, I was born around this time, that put my dad, my mom uh, into a very tough scenario. Mm -hmm. And it was a, it was a very tough time for quite a number of years. Next, uh, somewhere probably even five to ten years was a very rough time uh, for my dad. And here was a guy who was very successful and all of a sudden couldn't provide for his family. I and mean, he's lost everything. And watching my dad through that process, um, it was very difficult. I remember... I remember sleeping on mattresses on the floor because we couldn't have beds because if we bought anything that was considered an excess, the IRS, when they would come, would just confiscate it. Wow. So sleep on like mattresses on the floor, I remember. Uh, I slept. Then when my brother, my little brother was born a few, few years yeah, younger than me, I have two brothers. Um, also, we just slept on mattresses on the floor. I remember it was, um, eventually we got beds, but it was, but growing up in that environment and, and, and then seeing my dad come back on his feet um, and recover from that, and um, thank God he recovered well. And, you know, he's he does really well. Um, has made a, a big impact on me, I guess. Mm -hmm. it, it, seeing you know um, different sides of of life, um, and and seeing my dad overcome struggle um, in that regard. Um, I am very resistant to struggle as a result of that experience. I'd say it, you know, anything that's usually thrown at me, I handle it pretty well compared to most people. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it's because I had to internalize that growing up, uh, because it was very difficult for me, uh, growing up. It was really tough. Um, what was happening, you know, constantly. Yeah. And, um, and then I'd say my dad is also a guy who really I respect in many levels. He's, so I come from a Jewish family, um, and my dad um, is actually very big into prayer and spends about six, probably six plus hours a day in prayer. Wow. He says psalms every day for six, maybe to eight hours. And so he sits in his art gallery, and like a big part of his day is in prayer. And I've always found it fascinating how he could manage to be very successful in business and yet spend so much time like doing that, um, it was just always fascinating to me. Um, and I've learned a lot from, from that kind of balance yeah. where you don't need to be working 24 seven. Like you could be doing all these other like things. And my dad's also a very charitable guy. He spends a lot of his time doing a lot of just good things for people. Yeah. Uh, and that was a very big influence on me on, on, on balancing time. I would say in that regard. Um, what did you but, see with that? You see him spending six hours a day. I mean, six hours a day, of someone spending anything how did he balance that he just does it i mean it's incredible i you know mm -hmm. you would think i mean you, you just have to see someone do it and then you realize it's possible <laughs> right. um, but to just hear that it sounds almost impossible like how do you balance that but he does right. I, you know i mean he wakes up very early um he's an early riser um, he just finds the time to do it mm -hmm. yeah you know? So growing up, I mean, that sounds just like such a tough scenario for your parents. And then, you know, for you, what was the mentality like in the house? You know, was your dad, um, would he tell you certain talk about the business? Would he tell you kind of what he's doing to overcome? What was he, what was he teaching you and your brothers at that time? At that time, I mean, we were very little. So he didn't really talk to us about that at mm -hmm. that time very much. I mean, it was only later that I it was really able to understand the details of the yeah. situation. Um, but at that time, um, you know, I, I, at that time, it, he was just in a very bad place, I'd say, uh, in general, um, and did the best he can to, to get through it. Um, and uh, I mean, he was in such a bad place, I, you know, I'd say, I, you know, he once told me before, he doesn't know if he'd be here today if I wasn't, like, born. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, he, yeah. he 
like the will to go on. And it's, you know, and going through that, and thank God I never had an experience where I was in that kind of situation, but I was able to learn from seeing like my parents in such a tough situation. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, it, I, I learned a lot from that. Yeah. So what was for you one of your early entrepreneurial endeavors when you were younger? Oh, so, you know, it's funny. Um, I, I always knew I wanted to go into business from watching my dad. And, and independence and freedom was really one of the things I got from that, even though I saw the struggle he could get into as an entrepreneur. But in general, I mean, it wasn't, he just, you know, things happen. Right. Um, but, you know, to watch my dad be successful and spend so much time of his day doing what he, you know, what he wants to do, etc., cetera, um, influenced me and I want control over my own life as well. Yeah. Um, control over my own destiny. You know, whatever comes at me, I'll handle. Um, and I just want to do what I want to do. And I didn't really know for a long time what it is that I wanted to do. Um, but from a young age, I started experimenting and looking into options mm -hmm. uh, and so what I realized early on is I'm fascinated by business and fascinated by how to sell and so I really wanted to explore how to sell things and starting in I'd say high school and moving to college I started taking on all sorts of jobs now not for having a job but for the experience of how the company runs ship and sells. Hmm. Um, so I did the stints. I don't know uh, if you've seen in New York, there are people that sell comedy club tickets in the street. If you like walk through time, so I've sold comedy club tickets in the street. I've I've worked at like call centers um, for hmm. fundraisers. Hmm. Uh, you know, calling people up, asking them, you know, uh, for money for charity. I um, yeah, real estate. You know, apartments. Um, done that I I went through like multiple MLM programs um, like going through their training program to study that I I've taken up so many jobs for I'd say anywhere between two to four weeks in these kind of environments and I can hardly remember all of them because they were really many um, mm -hmm. and mostly just to figure out what they're doing because yeah. I was fascinated by you know by all this kind of stuff um, and I think in terms of actual entrepreneurship, I was a late bloomer. Um, you know, it's funny. The earliest thing I can remember doing was in high school. And I took, actually, um, when I went to college, I majored in psychology and, uh, and marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason I majored in psychology was in high school, I took a psychology class as an elective. And I absolutely fell in love with it. Um, Obviously, because I, I love to understand how people behave, and uh, I think it was just an inborn kind of thing. And so I absolutely fell in love with it so much that I went to every single class and basically word for word transcribed what my professor said. Literally, it was like a word for word transcript every single class. <laughs> and so what I quickly realized was, you know, and I would type them up too, so I hand wrote them. And then I went home and I typed these things up um, for my learning because I wanted to ingrain this as best as I can in my mind. I became a fanatic about psychology. But then I realized I have these typed notes and I said, wait a minute, um, I have these amazing notes that everyone else could probably benefit from. So I started selling those notes, those psychology notes, um, for about 20 bucks before every mm -hmm. test. Um, and they became known as like the Sam notes. Um, and that's probably my first venture into info marketing, actually. Yeah. Um, I first, like, you know, realized I could do that. And um, it, it's actually hilarious because I, I visited my high school even a year or two after I graduated. And the Sam notes were still circulating um, for that class. Um, but that was probably the first experience of actually creating something and then selling it. But I didn't even realize what I was doing. And it opened up my eyes to, to possibilities and things kind of went uh went from there um, into many years of exploration throughout college. Um, I tried a lot of things very briefly and dropped them consistently because I didn't know what I wanted to do. Yeah. I just wanted to to try and and understand and and you know and just do a lot of things in order to eventually find what I wanted to do. So I just get engrossed in something for two or three weeks and then drop it. And I mean that cycle repeated constantly until eventually. And I also was reading a lot at the same time. Mm -hmm. 
I read every marketing book I can um, mm. because I jumped from psychology into marketing um, transition, um, which is a smooth transition. Right. And um, and then eventually, I found direct marketing. Um, and then I realized, holy crap, now I'm onto something because I've been spending years trying to figure out like how to sell stuff in business. And I even majored at marketing in college. But up until that point, I didn't really have a formula that I felt like I have something that I know I can make work and replicate. And I didn't feel like I had something substantial until I discovered direct response mm -hmm. marketing. And that's why I fell in love with it because what it gave me was a sense of control and not just a sense, actual control over creating marketing that works. Right. And that's the control that I needed then to go into business. Um, and that's kind of how all that developed. How did you discover direct marketing? I, it's hard for me to trace back exactly mm -hmm. what was the first thing that I read um, because I was voraciously reading yeah. a lot of traditional marketing books. Mm -hmm. um, Al Reese, all, all the you know traditional marketing guys. Um, I do know that um, Vincent James' book, 12 Month Millionaire, was one of the first things that I read, but I don't remember. Mm -hmm. There were things that came before as well. Yeah, that was more influential. Yeah, that um, yeah, and eventually, you know, I, I forget exactly what was the first thing that led me to Gary, but eventually I found Gary, and then, yeah. then it was game over. Um, then I felt like I found the holy grail of having control. Um, How did you find Gary? What uh, led you to Gary? Again, through this reading process, and of mm -hmm. course, Vincent James talked a lot about Gary. I don't remember who was exactly the first, mm -hmm. but I started seeing a lot of roads lead to Gary, like mm -hmm. in this world. Yeah. And then I started reading his newsletters, and once I read his newsletters, I read all of them and then reread them again and then reread them a third time. And then became convinced that I need to just keep working up this ladder, um, and that eventually led me to working with Gary. Yeah. Um, but um, it, it was the element of of having control over my entrepreneurship mm -hmm. that that drove me here. Yeah. So how did you then approach Gary when you decided to I need to work with this man? So he had a newsletter that he once published where he made an offer of being able to apprentice under him. Mm -hmm. um, I forget the details of it, but I knew about that for a while and I one day decided, you know what, I'm going to take him up on that offer. And I was, to make money and decide at the time, I was always in the flux of trying all sorts of like things, but I was doing waitering as my main income type of uh, activity, uh, waitering at maitre d'ing which um, I did all throughout high school and college. Um, I loved it. It was great cash at the time for me. I could work when I wanted. Um, I didn't really have a boss in my jobs, which I liked. That's really it was a key thing of me keeping that. Um, and I had a lot of wild experiences and adventures and learnings from my waitering uh, life there. Um, but I was able to save up um, about... I had at that point when I decided I wanted to work with Gary uh, about sixteen thousand dollars saved just in savings cash. Yeah. Um, Go back to the wild learnings. You you smiled. You had a big smile when you said a wild learnings with the the waitering and uh, Major Ding. Is there a particular story that popped in your head? That's <sighs> This is one of many I'd say <laughs> that popped in my head there. But uh, all right, backtrack to that for a minute and then go back. To yeah. But uh, I, so I worked a lot with uh, with a caterer, like doing very big jobs. So I worked at a at a lot of like often I would, and I eventually began as a waiter, but worked a lot as a maitre d for him. And I would do parties like at a lot of the big hotels in New York, like the Marriott in Times Square, the Hilton. Um, I would maitre d weddings and things of that nature. And um, I moved up to that eventually. And it was very cool because I was, you know, I'm in high school, like college, and I'm, you know, and I'm like dining like a king, like first of all, um, because I'm talking about really high end like events and things like that. I would bring food back to my dorm and liquor like every single night from these parties. Like I was, you know, everyone loved me. Um, I would even invite friends to like the weddings because we're talking about weddings of like a few hundred <laughs> people. It's funny. So I'd invite like girls all the time. Be like, hey, why don't you dress up in a beautiful outfit? You know, they would come to like the reception and I'd hang out with them and uh 
and I just had all these fun times, but I, and I was able to do a lot of cool things, like um, one time I was working a wedding, and after, after the wedding, I think it was at a Married in Times Square, this one as well, they had a Tony's party, um, the Tony's after party, at the Married as well. Um, so me and a buddy of mine were wearing tuxes because we were major dating this thing. So we snuck into the Tony's after party to like hang out there. Um, one time I major dated a, a billionaire's birthday party in the Ukraine, um, a four-day birthday party that someone threw in, in the, the It was in the Ukraine? In the Ukraine, yeah. Um, so we hired the caterer that I was working for um, because the caterer was uh, someone that grew up in his hometown. It's actually a guy from my dad's hometown as well. Oh, so wow. my dad was him, and I had a lot of relatives at this wedding. That's amazing. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was pretty wild. And I end up like, like getting told, he, this guy, Alex Roth is his name, throws a four-day birth, birthday party um, in the Ukraine. And he, he got a plane, and he flew like 200 people from the United States to Ukraine for four days, put them up. He owned the hotel there, put them up in a hotel, get another hotel as well because there was so many people. And for four days, basically nonstop, hired all the like Russian, Ukrainian pop stars. Um, he had a fireworks display in the middle of the city. I'm talking about all out. I mean, just uh, but um, a lot of the people at the party were were relatives and friends of my dad because all from the same hometown. Mm -hmm. Everyone loved my dad. Um, everyone loved my dad because, as I said, my dad w was able to be successful back then um, in Ukraine, and he was also an extremely, always a generous, charitable, great person to everyone. Yeah. So I was basically, you know, I had to work and drink with everyone at the same time for four days straight, and didn't <laughs> sleep. It was the first time I had not slept for four days. You really didn't sleep not at all. Didn't sleep. Four days, no sleep, because the party did not stop. It went till four or five in the morning, wow. and then breakfast at seven. Wow. So. I'll tell you what happens after four days of no sleep. Yeah, I want to hear about this. Yeah, number one, you lose your appetite. Um, so at about day two or three, I stopped eating. I just couldn't eat anymore. Um, you know, you 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 just you, you completely just like shut off. I mean, I was like a like a zombie. Um, and um, you know, and then I remember the flight back. Um, someone told me uh, the person who was next to me on the flight back. They told me they thought I was dead because I. <laughs> out it was just lights out it's just no like vibing sam how did you stay up though for four days i mean that alone is hard to do yeah it, you know i'm gonna have to try the this thing that helped me was i i i was given a staff of i think about 25 ukrainian waitresses to manage over <laughs> who I think they just got from a modeling agency or I don't know. These girls have never waited before. I think you were just delirious <laughs> from not sleeping. They probably yeah. weren't that good looking. Well, no, well, but they kept me busy because they, they were new. They had no idea what they were doing. So I guess I, I was running around a lot. I was busy drinking, running around, <laughs> having a good time working. I had no choice. I, I just, there was no time to sleep. Um, so it was pretty wild. But I did learn a lot from, so you yes, like I actually did learn a lot from my waiting, waitering experiences um, that are very practical to business and things of that nature. Um, not just from waiting, but the major Ding, because number one, systems. I've learned systems, which is something that a lot of people lack. Yeah. Uh, when you're running a party of that magnitude, I mean, you have to be on top of a lot of things. Right. And you need systems for everything. And with a lot of experience, I've quickly learned um, how to pre-plan for everything that could possibly go wrong, because you eventually see everything that could possibly yeah. go wrong. So, you know, you develop systems, backup plans, um, customer service, I've learned, you know, a lot about, like, customer service, making people happy. I've learned all the tricks of, like, increasing tips, um, things of that nature. Um, so there were, there were a lot of learnings that I could go on for a long time about in that regard, but they were very significant. Yeah. Um, and I'll give you a practical example systems-wise. Um, you know, so I'm very efficient. Like, I, I've had times where I would run smaller parties. And I'll end with this example, but this yeah. is something that you could probably learn from. Yeah. Uh, where, you know, um, it was a party where a caterer just dropped off the food, and I was supposed to work with four people. Uh, one or two of us would be in the kitchen just getting everything ready. The caterer would just put everything in the ovens and leave. And it was 100 pe guests and dishes and nine. Yeah. So for four people, that's manageable to, to do that like operation. However, Turns out no one shows up. It was just me. <laughs> so I'm in that room myself. 
hundred people are coming in, you know, and that. <laughs> it's horrible to laugh at, but like, it, yeah. No, it's, it's, yeah. it's, you know, it's terrible. Yeah. So I have to serve as a hundred people a dining room and also work the kitchen, like prep all the food and, and the whole, the whole entire thing like me. Now I was able to pull that off, um, running a l- a little behind normal, obviously, but I was able to pull the whole thing off. Most people would not be able to pull that whole thing off, no yeah. matter how much experience they would have um, waitering major thing. The only reason I was able to do it is because I was, I knew my stuff so well and how to do things so efficiently and quickly that I was able to do it. And I'll give you, you know, like even running kitchens of mass sizes, for example. Um, Take chefs, um, so you walk into most kitchens during a massive dinner and everything's disorganized. Like I would organize things to the degree where I'd say, all right, we have like an oven here and an oven here, right? And we have six dishes that have to go out. And I'd evaluate how many people we've got that could serve them. And I would serious, I would position everyone. I would say, all right, you are going to serve this dish. This dish is going to take about X amount of time to scoop up from like something. I want you to use your right hand to scoop this. Mm. Use your left hand like for the plate. Or you're going to put this here to pass it to this guy, etc. And do that so elaborately that I would find the quickest, most efficient way mm. to get things out the door, like extremely systematically to yeah. a degree that most people never like do. Um, and I would pre-plan this. I would spend like half an hour thinking, how am I going to work the passing of plates and everything most efficiently, depending on what food has to go on the plate? And, you know, and most people don't think that way. So... A great example is like Southwest Airlines. Um, they created a competitive advantage that was incredible when they, when they did it originally, which is when a plane lands into an airport, um, I think they call it the turnaround time, which is a time it takes for people to get off the plane and then for them to refuel the plane and, and stock up food and, and clean it up and, and put the luggage in. So most airlines, and maybe things are different today, but most airlines originally um, had 12 different teams to do this, the luggage team, the food team, right. etc. And it would take about, I don't know, 40, 50 minutes maybe to for like turnaround time. Southwest analyzed things and said, you know what, this is taking a long time and it's probably because we have 12 different teams doing this. Why don't we create one turnaround team? And so they created one team instead of 12 different teams and cut the time from like 40 or 50 minutes to I think like under 20 minutes. Um, and it gave them tremendous competitive advantage. They'd be able to get like every plane would have like another you know route it could fly every day and I mean just, so that kind of like systematic thinking is very very useful in business in many regards um so i definitely learned that and yeah there's still physical limitations so you have a hundred person party and you're the only person there because no one shows up even if you have things efficient it almost seems impossible for you to to handle all that it's pull offable now of course i did have like one or two well i have probably i remember two people that I had helped me um, to a degree a little bit, but yeah, I mean, yeah. for, I still did that myself, That's and it crazy. is doable um, if you know what you're doing right. very, very well. Yeah. So then you decide you're an apprentice with Gary. Yes. All right. So we sidetracked a lot there. Yes. I had um, to hear you just had this huge smile on your face when you said that. Yeah. So I. Sorry. Yeah. It was just good memories. That's yes. all. Yes. Um, but that was a total sidetrack. So yes. let's get back on track. Um, so. Apprenticing under Gary. Where were we in that? Yeah, regard? so you were, you decided you're going to apprentice oh, under yeah. Gary. Yeah, so I had 16 grand about saved up from wagering. That's where we sidetracked. And Gary wanted, I think, uh, 27 grand, he told me, in order to, well, yeah, I think it was 27K, which was what, what it would be if we were to do this. So, long story short, I, or so I read in his letter, it was 27K. That's right. That's what I read. So I was like, all right. I ended up asking my dad if he would lend me um, some money. And he asked me for what? And I said, well, I want to contact some crazy lunatic in Miami. Is that uh, how you phrased it to your dad? Like, <laughs> we, yeah. My dad, of course, is looking at me like I've totally lost it. And at this point, you know, he is wondering what's going to happen because he's been seeing me jump around so much. He was wondering where, you know, and what. So he basically told me, he's like, look, I'm going to lend you the money, but this is this is it. I mean, you know this is the last money I'm lending you, you need to like figure stuff out. And he thought I'm, you know, 
I'm crazy. Everyone thought I'm crazy. Um, I ended up writing a letter to Gary, and I attached a check for 10%. I think it was $2,700 to the top of it, and I wrote him a letter explaining why I want to apprentice under him. And this is before contacting him. I assumed it was twenty-seven grand to apprentice under him. Um, and he ended up calling me back and saying, hey, I read your letter. Um, let's do it. And I was like, okay. And then he said, what are you doing Monday? <laughs> and I was like, Monday? I forget what day this was, like Tuesday or Wednesday or something. And so long story short, I put the phone down and I'm like, all right, I'm packing my bags. I'm going to Miami. Um, and I was in New York and I was, and Gary was in Miami. So I literally packed up and I had to get a hotel for three weeks uh, as well, right next to Gary that he recommended to me. I checked in and that's kind of how it happened. I just decided um, that I, that I need to do this. And, uh, you know, it was the first time that I'd borrowed money for anything. I'm against, uh, being in any kind of debt. Um, I pay cash for everything. I don't, you know, but, um, I, I just felt it's what I had to do. And so I went for it, yeah. um, and ended up there. And that's when all the Gary adventures began. Yeah. So yeah. tell me about one of the first Gary adventures. Were you only there for three weeks or did you stay there longer? So, no, um, he asked me to stay on with him after those three weeks. Okay. I ended up working with him until he passed away. It was about oh, wow. a year or so. Yeah. So um, what did you do in those three weeks? Those three weeks. Well, the first, all right, so the first day I came, um, I remember the morning. Uh, he came into my room the first morning. It was Monday morning, I believe. And um, I was very nervous. Um very nervous for a number of reasons. Number one, I just spent all the money I saved up, like money from my dad. Like, what have I gotten myself into? Number two, like, you know, I had Gary framed as a very colorful character. I had no idea what to expect. So he walks into the room and, you know, and he does a few things. Number one, he gave me Scott Haynes' course, Shortcut Copywriting Secrets. And he said, I want you to read this today. This is the first thing that I want you to do. Then he said, he named me a few trips that we were going to make um, very shortly. Um, so he said, just get ready. We're going to Costa Rica. We're going to San Diego. We're going da 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 da. Um, and, um, and that was really my, my first uh, interaction with him is read this course and get ready to, to go on some wild adventures. Um, and over the first three weeks, it was really different tasks that he gave me to do in order to work on my copywriting skills. Now, I was studying copywriting a lot at that point. Um, I've been through a lot of things. Um, so I was able to progress ahead a lot quicker than someone who knows nothing about copywriting, certainly. Um, but it was eventually going down the path of giving me different exercises to learn to write copy better, watching him write copy. Um, me watching him write copy and talking about like the process to me writing copy, um, you know, and then me writing most of the copy like for him for sales letters with him making some tweaks up eventually um, two months later to me just writing full blown campaigns for him. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, what are some of your biggest learnings from Gary when you go from obviously seeing him? Writing it, getting tweaks, and then just writing it on your own. What were some big lessons from Gary? There were many big lessons uh, from Gary. Um, you know, that question always puzzles me because there's so many I have to pick some. Right. But, um, you know, in fact, I think my laptop, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get up and walk over here to Go ahead. the room um, because my laptop is uh, <laughs> on low battery, apparently. I'm going <laughs> to... Um, the billionaire story with the in the hotels of the Ukraine sucked all the battery out. Ah, uh, yes, it did. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, Gary Halbert. Um, there were. I'll give you an overview of it, of what were some of the really big takeaways yeah. um, from this experience. So, number one, which was shocking to me is that he said, Sam, one piece of advice that I'll give you is I recommend you don't try to become the world's best copywriter. Hmm. 
And I was surprised to hear that from him um, because I thought that's I'm there to learn how to become like the world's best copywriter. Hmm. Um, and the reason he said that was a fewfold. Um, and essentially, so I was with Gary the last year of his life, and I think that I was able to get a lot of takeaways you know, from the culmination of all his experience um, at that point. Um, not just copyright related, but life related, etc. Um, dedicating your life to become the best copywriter in the world is dedicating your life to it. It's sacrificing everything else. He literally sacrificed everything else that he's done in order to get to that point. Yeah. Um, and it's really not necessarily worth it because if you can get very good at writing copy, then that's really all you need. You don't need to be number one unless you want to be competing head to head with the best of the world. Um, you're usually better off becoming very good and writing lots of copy. It will get you a lot richer than trying to become number one and taking a very long time to write copy. Um, so he instilled upon me that lesson very early on. Um, and even though I still worked to become as best as I can, um, you know, that was his philosophy on that. Um, in terms of actual, um, so he, all right, let's take, um, let's take details. Um, here's an exercise he gave me to do. Um, I remember early on, um, we, he wanted to test an ad in direct mail and so he said I want you to put together the mailing um, and it was going to be a penny mailing so I literally had to go and um, get printed up you know a thousand of the sales letters and get a thousand pennies and buy a thousand envelopes and come home and you know basically take all thousand sales letters and tape a penny to each of them and z fold all of the letters and then stuff all the letters into an envelope and then you know hand write the address and 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 the whole nine yeah to get it ready to mail and doing a thousand of those um is a very painful experience i'll say uh, you know at the very least um and then we would put it in the mail um now the reason for that exercise is it's an exercise about details, essentially. Um, so after that experience, I had a very good understanding of what, a ma you know, what it takes to put a mailing together and all the pieces involved. Um, so that later, when I actually manage over fulfillment houses to do this, I mean, number one, like I now under when you understand something and you've done it, the way you're able to manage over something is completely different. Mm -hmm. You have way more control um, over how you're able to manage something. Number two, because it was so painful, the importance of that mailing working well becomes very important. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like you, know, that, you don't want that to fail at that point, you know. Um, and you just start understanding details. And he was very detail orientated uh, about everything in his writing, which was really something that you know, was fascinating to me. I like his coat of arms letter, which was one page mailed 600 million times. You could, I could spend a few hours breaking down that letter in terms of the detail like involved there. And I think Gary's son Bond actually did that somewhere um, as well. Um, and, you know, he taught me not only to look at the big stuff, um, but the really small stuff as well, um, to the point of like, I'll give you an example of like a detail. Yeah. Like signatures in a letter. Let's take let's take signatures. Something that probably a lot of people don't think of because they just sign, and that's that. Right. So if you go to Gary's uh, uh, website, you'll see his signature um, being a full signature. It's Gary C. Dot Halbert. Very easy to overlook. Um, but believe it or not, I have actually taken time in the past to study handwriting analysis for the sake of how do I improve signatures in direct mail pieces and make sure that I have the best signatures that I can specifically for trust and credibility. Mm -hmm. Now a lot of people sign signatures by taking their first name like initial, you know, so like people would just do like, all right, let's take your name, Jeremy Weiss, and do J. Weiss, you know, or they, you know, do J. Weiss and not even like 
finish the last name. Just have like a want line or a squiggly going right, through right. or whatever it is. Um, when you don't, when you do that, that basically communicates the subconscious. Either I'm too busy for you, which is not what you want to <laughs> communicate to your prospect. I'm too busy for you. That mm-hmm. I don't have enough time to write my full name out to you. Um, it can communicate I'm hiding something that I don't want to write out my full name. Um, you're hiding behind something. You're closed off in some way. It actually subtly communicates those things subconsciously. And so if you want to instill full trust in somebody, um, writing out your full name in a signature is actually the most trustworthy way to do it. Mm. Um, and then there's all sorts of other things like uh, having a blue ink signature if you do yeah, it the right Yeah, I noticed name. that on your site actually. That, that you have oh, a have blue it? Yeah, you have a blue ink signature on there. I do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that just pulled because it works in direct mail. And mm-hmm. the reason it works in direct mail, there have been a few tests that people have done where I forget the lifts, but people have shown lifts from blue ink signature hmm. um, from traditional direct mail pieces because they're black and white and what a blue ink signature does is it shows like someone when you send someone a typed letter, it's not personal, you know, it's typed. But like, so if you sign in black ink, it kind of like, you know, fits in with the rest of the type. Right, but right. blue ink shows like you personally took a blue pen to write out your signature. Right, yeah. and it adds this personability to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and blue ink does bump response in those letters. Um, it's been proven for that reason. Um, having... Uh, then there's all sorts of other things depending on what you want to communicate in your signature. Um, like if you want to communicate leadership, um, having an underline under your signature communicates leadership. A lot of people that are powerful underline their yeah. signatures. Um, there's all these other things that I could go on about right. signatures. But like people don't think about these things. Right. Um, you know, and actually Gary never spoke to about signatures particularly. Um, but like he taught me to think about all these things. He told me to think about everything in a letter. Um, and everything matters because it creates a whole that's far superior. Um, so I've learned a lot in that regard. Um, another thing that was very useful that I've learned a lot about with Gary is um, what he had that most people, that most writers do not have, and by most there are others that do, but in the aggregate most don't, is flexibility. And by flexibility, I mean flexibility to write in numerous markets and in numerous channels and media. I mean, we did newspaper ads, direct mail, online, like everything, in all sorts of markets. Um, Most copywriters specialize. There are benefits to specializing, uh, tremendous ones. I highly recommend the copywriters to specialize. However, Gary did not specialize. Um, It makes your life a lot more insane not to specialize and to do so much. I mean, we've worked in, I I can't even count how many like markets we've worked in. We've worked in a lot of markets um, and a lot of media. And that experience has given me a way to look at marketing that on a grand level, it really refined it. The same way details have refined it, it, my mind got very refined in expanding like how to look at all the ways you could do something in a marketing situation. And then piecing together what is the best, the, the best plan of attack for a scenario. Because there's so many options when you look at the world with so many media and so many channels. And today we're flooded with with endless channels. I mean, there's new channels all the time. Um, the problem isn't how do I make money? How do I make more money? The problem is is like where do I begin? Um, because there's so many options. Like what do I choose is really the problem if you know what you're doing. Right. Um, and in every channel and market, um, things are different. I mean, Gary was not a one... He had a lot of tricks, um, but he would approach how to go about something in many different ways, um, you know, within each media as well. I mean, you know, um, from, you know, one-step advertising to two-step advertising to all sorts of different, like, variations. Um, So that was certainly very educational. Um, Another very educational thing that he taught me um, would be the concept of taking off the chains, um, as he would call it. And so we mentioned research, I mentioned research before and the importance of research, um, which really is highly important. Um, and it's a trump card if you do that very well. Another trump card, which is kind of 
on the other extreme is is the concept of the magic wand. If you have a magic wand and you could do whatever you want, say whatever you want, create whatever product you can create, like what would you do in order to to hook that market and and and, and get the market like raving about you and love what you have? Um, and those are two different processes is the way I look at them. There's a the research and there's a the magic wand. And he taught me to do both. And he, the way I go about things is I usually begin with, you kind of alternate between the two. Um, but the problem with diving right into research, like head on fully, is that eventually you create limitations in your mind because you start becoming limited by what you've discovered in the research. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you're looking at what a client sends you and you, your mind starts getting limited limited to I have to like approach mm. things in this way, cover mm. these things, this is what he's given me. Um, versus the magic wand is forget what the client has. Um, ignore everything. Knowing that I want to reach this market, like what would I do? And actually that's where Gary would begin. So, you know, if someone wanted to hire him for a golf promotion, Gary wouldn't begin with the thinking of let me see what he's got. It would be, all right, you know, um, what do you I have do to do anything. I yeah. could do, yeah, I could do anything. What would I do? And then he'd look at the research, what this guy was got, and then it's about bridging. Mm. Um, however, you know, it's a combination of the two that make you very, very good. Um, and so I'd say that's a, a key thing that he taught me. Um, gun to the head mentality. Um, I don't know if you've heard that before, but that's a, a very key thing that he's taught me. Um, that was a big part of success for his coat of arms promotion. Where what did he say about that? He was... Uh, so when Gary wrote the coat of arms, he was in a bad place financially. Um, I think he couldn't even pay his light bill. I mean, um, it was very bad. And he basically sat down and the thinking was, um, if my, you know, if my, the concept of gun to the head mentality is saying to yourself, if my life is on the line, you know, if I don't make this promotion work, I'm going to die, you know, or even better often is if I don't make this work, my mother is going to die. Um, cause often you get a lot more motivated if a loved one is going to die right. rather than, um, that kind of thinking approach, you know, to, to a promotion, a campaign or starting something, um, is something that I, I like to, you know, actually employ before I start writing something. Cause when you're writing a campaign, especially for a client, I mean, it's a very serious thing. There's a lot at stake, not just the money, the time, I mean, for, you know, the business, the customers, the employees, the vendors. I mean, there's, it's a very serious thing. It ain't mm -hmm. a joke. It ain't a, you know, it's a very serious thing. So you want to take it very, very seriously. And that gun to the Manhattan mentality is really just saying, if I had a gun to my head, I had to make this work, what would I do? It pushes you. To number one, have breakthroughs you otherwise wouldn't have, and number two, to just frame yourself to make sure you're doing everything you can to make that work. Um, mm. And so that was a key takeaway. Um, I don't. Those are a few. I mean, I could like, go on, but maybe you have other questions. What was another one with the coat of arms? Um, what was a big <clears throat> um, takeaway? Or obviously, you said you know I could analyze the coat of arms for hours or days. What was something that sticks out to you that you think most people miss in the, looking at the coat of arms letter? You know, um, there's a lot. And I'd have to look at it to refresh my mm -hmm. minute because I haven't looked at it in a little while now. Um, essentially, the reason that worked is what I covered before, which is Gary hit the nail on the head for for a mass marketplace yeah. is, is really what happened there. And if you read that letter today, it wouldn't necessarily make sense to you, uh, perhaps, because it's it's a bit outdated in terms of where people's heads are at. Um, but at that time, he just hit the nail on the head where, mm -hmm. where the mass market is at. And that's, I mean, if you read that, that's the biggest takeaway. And that's mm -hmm. what you want to look at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what were you referring to taking off the chains? So ah, so taking off the chains is is taking off the that it's the magic wand concept gotcha. where you're you know so we tend to have chains about what we can say can say we're thinking about legal stuff like I also you know I've done a lot of work in nutraceuticals you know there's a lot of legal stuff you cannot do high it's highly regulated and you want to follow everything and it's it's a very serious thing you don't want to mislead people you have to make proper claims etc however 
if like you're starting with those limitations in your thought process, you, it limits you from, from having breakthroughs that you otherwise may not have had. I'll tell you something. I had a setback there that just happened uh, in the last week or two. I was, um, I was going to start a law firm with somebody, um, a lawyer that I've known for a long time and uh, for many, many years. He's uh, done work for me, um, critiquing ads, all sorts of things. Great guy. Um, and we decided um, we'll start a law firm together. I, I thought it's a cool concept. Um, and he actually, he passed away two weeks ago. Like oh we were God. literally at the brink of like launching it and he passed away. I'm so sorry. Uh, oh my God. So yeah, it was, it's crazy things will happen in, in business. And it's a greater loss as he was a friend and, you know, on a personal level, it's mm. a greater loss to business, whatever. Um, but he he was a guy who I loved to critique my copy because unlike other lawyers whose heads are what can you not do his process was all right what can you say and he would actually write a lot of like copy for me um, just rewriting stuff in a way that I could say things um, all the time for me and I love him for that I I to this day have not found a lawyer that would go to that extent he just had such marketing agility he probably would have been like an amazing marketer if he wasn't a lawyer um, but you know he taught me that there's always a way to do something um, maybe not always but there's very often a way to do something and if you begin with the limitations you'll never get there yeah. um, so it's it's that concept yeah so, Sam, what are some of your favorite Gary stories of all time? Oh, goodness. Um, Gary stories of all time. Um, you know, most of them are, most of them are triple X, so I can't share most <laughs> of them, unfortunately. <laughs> um, they are, they are, they are wild. Um, they are, I, you know, I, I would have to publish a manuscript anonymously one day. Um, <laughs> but I can't even, I can't even, nothing comes to my head, like triple X. I can't even imagine what you would say for that. Yeah, it quite literally, I don't really mean that. It's, uh, I, I could, I could spill off like a hundred triple X stories, but to find one that's not triple X is tough, <laughs> which is a testament to the man of, of Gary Hufford and what kind of a colorful character he was. But I, I could share with you, um, you know, some things that come to mind in terms of uh, what general daily life with him was like and the kind of things we do and generally the kind of trouble we get into. Um, so Gary was a, was a fascinating uh, individual. Um, if you spent a lot of time with him and didn't really understand what he was doing, you would think he never worked, ever. Um, besides once in a while in a blue moon in the middle of nowhere saying, Sam, I need a pen and notepad, and you give it to him and he writes out a full sales letter. I mean, that's, that's what you'd see sporadically every now and then and think like, that's what he works, you know, an hour sporadically, who knows when it'll happen, um, and that's it. Um, his process was all in his head. Um, you know, um, he would spend. Mo his process was to goof around essentially, um, and subconsciously like come up with the answers he was looking for for his copy. Um, but he would purposely not to think about like work or copy, goof around in order to distract his mind, and he needed to do that most of the time. And it's something I I learned, and it actually works. Um, I could go into a whole talk about writing copy from your subconscious rather than your conscious. Um, and there is a process to that. But we would spend a lot of time goofing around for that purpose. You know, we'd wake up and you would never know when you would wake up in the morning what's going to happen today with Gary. There was no schedule. There was no format. Um, and every day you'd wake up and wonder if you were going to live or die. You don't know what's, you don't know what's going to happen. So you wake up and he would be like, all right, you know, Let's get in the car. And sometimes I would wonder if he even knew where he, he's going or he doesn't know where he's going. But, you know, we would end up wherever we would end up. Um, very often we – so things that were commonalities. He loved to go to, to Barnes & Noble. Um, he loved to go to the movies. Um, we do that all the time. He loved to go boating. Everyone has boating stories with Gary. 
um, yeah. life and death scenarios. I mean, I was in both, you know, the very last time I was in a boat with him, um, we get in a boat and it, the steering only worked one way. Like it wouldn't steer the other direction. Okay. Um, and, and yet he insists like to go out, like just out. And, you know, we're, we're like, we're going like in between all, all sorts of boats. And I'm just thinking, you know, it's only a matter of seconds until we crash into somebody because we can only mm -hmm. steer one direction. Like you should not be going boating when you cannot steer like another direction. You know, it's not a good idea. Um, so like he would know going in, like there's a lot of boating stories of being in a boat, everything's fine. And then calamity happens. But like even going in, knowing that there's danger, no, nah, it's totally cool. Um, so, you know, a lot of dangerous boat stories, um, a lot of, uh, a lot of travel. Um, you know, uh, we've been to Costa Rica a few times with him, um, I cannot begin to tell you the stories that transpired there, but there were a lot of. He was he was a wild man. He he was also curious to check out. Curiosity was a big thing, by the way. So we would spend a lot of time playing guessing games. Um, by guessing games, I mean what like what would people do if? Um, and that would be like if Gary wanted to call someone and get a certain outcome. Like we would debate. Um, uh, he would be like, well, what do you think if I said this in the phone, what do you think they would do? You know, and then he would ask me, what do you think I should say? What do you think they would do? And then we come up with like the final thing to say, and then we would make a bet. He would be like, what do you think will happen? Their reaction, what do you think the reaction will be like immediately in like three days and in a week? And often we play in these different time periods. Um, and we'd guess like how the person would react and behave. Um, and we actually like bet. And this was like his thinking process all the time. Um, with everyone. Um, he always liked to test people. Every time we go out, he would say absolutely crazy things. Um, he would say things that would embarrass you, embarrass others, that would shock you. Uh, um, that, that would, some things, you know, were even, I mean, s some jokes, some like very offensive, all in good nature though. I think mostly because he was curious about reaction. You know, he, he wanted to know, what if I do this? Like, how will this person react? Um, and that caused a lot of uh, crazy behavior um, in that regard. Um, I don't know. I mean... Uh, what was the time you won the bet? Oh, time I won the bet. Um, he usually won those bets. Um, I didn't get good enough in in that time frame to win those bets. I mean, he, you know, it's funny. And don't get me wrong, there were times that I was, I was right. I can't remember any specific time that I was right in a big way. Um, but he understood human behavior in, to levels that are extremely deep. And that's really what made him an amazing copywriter and marketer. Um, a lot of people think of him as a copywriter. I don't think of him as a copywriter. I think of him as a, as a marketing strategist, as a behavioral psychologist um, who just happened to be able to get what he knows on paper. Mm -hmm. uh, but what his was brain... What you remember thinking, how did he know that, how they were going to act when he said a certain shocking statement? Yeah, you know, um, and he was wrong a lot too. Often we'd both be wrong, but I'll give you an example of like, uh, I'll give you an example of a lesson he taught me, and this is actually played out. Um, I just don't want to give specific scenarios, um, but he he once told me, and I'm not advocating or not advocating this approach. I'm just telling you what he told me. Um, he said, all right, if you have someone in your life who you need to end your relationship with. He said, most people go about it too softly. Um, and if you go about it too softly, it ends, up, it ends up creating a prolonged process of back and forth. Like imagine like, you know, you want to break up with someone and often in relationships, people will, that could be a prolonged, like terrible like process, you know. I remember first time he told me, he said, you know, if you want to cut something off with someone, you need to do it sharply, swiftly, with an ax, as sharply, as swiftly as you possibly can. He's like, you need to do it in a big way. And 
his thinking on that was, you know, if you do that harshly enough, then that person will be so hurt and so taken aback by what just happened, they'll just never be able to speak to you again. And if you can accomplish that, <laughs> Gary's philosophy was that you have done the best thing you could do for that person because you have just saved them months of agony back and forth with you and you have just cut things off and allowed the person now to, to also heal quicker from that kind of experience because mm-hmm. um, even though it's a much harsher blow, like his thinking was you, you can often heal quicker thereafter instead of it taking a very long time. Um, and you'd be able to move on quicker because the person would know very clearly in their minds that this was it. You know, there would be no question. There would be no question of maybe we could still have some kind of a relationship or maybe something could happen. Um, and his thinking was that was the best thing you could do um, for that reason, even though you may seem like a terrible person. Um, and I remember the first time he advised me to do that. And then, you know, I would see, I would see situations of like us debating with people, um, how to go about a scenario and issues like this will come up. Well, you know, and, uh, so I just don't want to mention specifics or anything like that, but like, just to give you an example of like the way he would think things through. And then we'd, we'd, you know, we'd play this game of what would happen. What's the best thing to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. I hope that helps. Um, yes. It, specific example but it's an example so sam what is i'm looking at the clock actually we're past the hour um about what time do you have just so i uh how much time do you have actually what time is it now it's um your time i think it's 4 12 i've got another half an hour i definitely have to be out by five but i've got half an hour okay Mm -hmm. um so what are some of the most successful campaigns that you could talk about or, and what made them effective? Um, so we kind of already covered, um, the hundred million dollar one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the success factors there. And I'd say the same success factors have always worked for me. Um, if you want, I could go into more, detail than about, you know, the way I think about ads or things like that. But those would be the overall, the big things that have always worked for me are certainly mass appeal, um, getting the right message. Gary would always say it's it's much better to be a skilled knower than a skilled writer. Mm-hmm. And that's really what it comes down to. Um, and then doing the work, you know. Um, so it's all those elements um, that are really the key things time and time again. Um, has really been my success formula. Um, so to dig in deeper, if you want, I could tell you about, you know, uh, some 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 of the ways that I look at an ad and how to maximize effectiveness. So yeah, that would help. definitely. Sure. So let me think where to begin. Um, What's another campaign? I guess so. You, we talked about the hundred million dollar campaign. What campaign do you look back on? And think I just knocked this out of the park. So that that campaign was actually the beginning of a number of campaigns yeah. um, that that I've done with that client then on for about two years, um, and there were many. Um, I mean, we did info products, we did nutraceuticals, we did things like teeth whitening, um, and. I've developed a formula there early on of doing very high volume in in mass markets like this. I mean, we're you know we're doing significant volume. Every campaign would be about a thousand plus orders a day type of campaigns wow. um, in in mass markets. But the formula was well, I shouldn't say that. I, I've used very different types of ads in various different campaigns. But the formula was always the same as I told you. It was mass market, hit the mail, hit the nail on the head type of stuff. I mean, has the re, what allows me to do the high volume is mass market. Um, that's really what it is. And knowing how to do that very effectively. Um, but there were many campaigns um, that I've done uh, since then. Um, same formula, Jeremy. I really can. Well, what can't. else? Because, you know, there's people who are in mass market who maybe have the hot button who don't have the same results as you. So you have something that 
most everyone <clears throat> is not doing, right? So <clears throat> from a campaign standpoint, um, it does come down to conversion. Um, and your and that comes down to copy to a great degree online that also has to do with design other factors um, but that comes down to copy um, however I'll give you an example a lot of the campaigns that I've done before um, are what I call multi-step online campaigns um, so people would come to you know there would be before people see the ad, there would be there's content that they see, you know, prior to the ad um, that pre-frames them. Um, articles, things like that. You'll see um, guys. I'll give you examples of other guys you could take a look at, um, like Force Factor. Um, a lot of their stuff they use. Uh, um, it's really a pre-sell page, is what it is. Is what you can call it. There's jump pages, different names for it. Um, native advertising, whatever you want to call it. People will come to a certain page. Um, which pre-frames them um, before they land on the landing page. And then my landing pages would often be like multi-page campaigns. Like a lot of people do one or two pages. A lot of mine were three, four pages um, with qualification processes um, where you actually have to qualify in order to buy like the product. Yeah. Um, and I'd say a lot of it is is looking at things as a sale in a much bigger way than people normally think of it and using a lot of triggers that a lot of people may know of but don't take to the full extent. Um, like the example of like having people qualify to to buy your thing. Now, there's some people that actually do do it in a cheesy way, um, but you could do it in, in very sophisticated ways. Yeah. Um, and so... You know, certainly it's the way I would approach campaigns, and every campaign yeah. would be different. Um, but, but yeah, it's still the same commonality. Yeah. I mean, you do it on your site, right? I mean, if if you didn't respond to my email, Sam, I was going to fax in a request because that's what you ask for on your on your site. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. And now, granted, the site that I have up, I don't really prospect um, or seek, I work with a few guys, um, mm -hmm. that is going to change um, in terms of some new offerings I'll probably put out in the future, but not yet. Mm -hmm. um, so this site was largely built as a page to have a page about me right. so that people don't think I don't exist because I'm not <laughs> social media. I, I was beginning to think that actually. If yeah. you didn't know that page, I would have thought that. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. But um, it, And it's also about... Um, so look, also a lot of my campaigns would drive people to the phone. I'd have a portion of people not ordering online, but actually ordering like, you know, on the phone. Um, people are very limited, I think, in a, a lot of how they approach uh, advertising, um, you know, and I guess I try to hit things up in a much broader way often than, than people realize. So, um, and... It's also doing, I'll give you a secret. So if you want a secret to like improving like results. And when I start a campaign, um, one of the big things that I want to know is why people are not ordering. Okay. So I have figured out early on that what I want to initiate from the very beginning is I would launch like a new landing page. But when people exit, I would have an exit questionnaire an exit pop that would ask them a few questions, usually three questions, around why they didn't proceed to the next page. Um, in addition, I would often find ways to get their phone number so that I could call them hmm. and find that information out. Yeah. Um, so a lot of my pages um, ask for phone number somewhere in the process. But often I would move the phone number up to the very beginning, even though I wouldn't want that there because it would reduce response in many instances. It depends on the campaign. But let's say even a campaign where you don't want the phone number in the first step because it will reduce response. I would put it in there anyway. Let's say your first step is a squeeze page and you're asking for name and email. Here's a secret. Put the phone number in there for a while at first, not for response sake, but because that could decrease response, um, but because you can now call those people and ask them questions. Why'd you move forward? Why didn't you move forward? 
Whereas if you don't have the phone numbers, you cannot get that information. Right. A big secret is really communication with people. It's knowing your market. Like mm -hmm. if I was to give like one tip, um, it would be know your market better. Like speak to your customers. Get yeah. away from your computer. Um, they have the answers. Um, and a lot of optimization for me comes from that kind of process. So, you know, in the initial sale, like I, you know, you could put up exit questionnaires, you could get phone numbers and call people up, ask them why they're not proceeding. And you could do the same for every step like thereafter. If you want to know how to optimize your upsells, um, there's a lot of like things that you could usually rely on for upsells, for example. I mean, you could, uh, people want more of the same of what they just ordered. They want a better version. They want a faster result. Uh, they want uh, automation. They want to move up to a higher level of service, you know, that's more personalized or whatever it is. I mean, there's that's kind of the gist of what often works in an upsell process. Um, however, at the same time, why don't you call the people who ordered the upsell and call the people who didn't? Mm -hmm. Talk to them, right. you know, and because that's the insight that's going to help you optimize. And then the same thing with right. your thereafter um, in your relationship yeah. with your customers. A lot of online guys do surveys. Surveys are nice, but how many of them are actually calling their people right. and talking to them? Like what you will get in a survey is good, and you'll get some good information. But what you'll get on the phone is far superior. Yeah. Um, by light years, and the guy who's willing to pick up the phone. Um, so, skincare company um, that I've been involved in for for a while. Um, I spent about a year um, working out largely, literally in the call center. Like we had operations in house, and the CEO was a very smart man. Um, he actually positioned. We had offices um, separate from everyone else. But we were usually not there. We were when we were in the private offices, away from all the other employees and departments. That was goofing off time. Maybe some strategy. We had to talk. We had conference calls, meetings. Um, but I spent most of the time with the CEO, sitting at a desk in the middle of the call center. And that was by far the best thing that like I could have done when I was in the office is yeah. listening to what the agents were talking about with the people on the phone. Right. And often I, you know, I come in and I, you know, I'd ask questions, I jump in, I like that's where the gold is, yeah. Jeremy. If you want a big secret, it's yeah. right there. And most people just won't do it. I mean, I, I could say it and preach that day and night, but you know. Yeah. People just don't want to do that work. They don't want to get their hands dirty. Um, I tell the CEOs all the time too. You know, um, same thing. But no one wants to get their hands dirty. So, what did you find? What were some reasons why people didn't proceed? There's all sorts of reasons. Um, sometimes I've had times where it actually pointed out tech issues, like very early on that I that we didn't notice early on. Um, when you're doing high volume, that could be a big help too. Um, uh, so, but that was a rare occasion, but did happen. Um, and reasons, reasons would vary by campaign. Um, I'm going to tell you something that, uh, it, it comes down to objections and there are certain objections that are recurrent, right. um, you know, price objections, things of that nature. Um, uh, I'm not sure if I believe you guys, all that kind of stuff, um, and then there's stuff that's specific to a campaign. Um, but, you know, what I will share with you in that process is, um, is a big takeaway that I got early on in that first, that 100 million campaign there. The feedback that I got about why people order, and this is what's fascinating, was that it came down to trust. They said, you know, like, the personality in the ad, they said, I just trust like this person hmm. so much. Um, and when I first heard that feedback, hmm. I was taken aback by it because even though I knew I put a lot of work into that, I wasn't expecting that to be as significant. And I'm pointing this out, like the the why they bought as opposed to why they didn't, because I think there's a bigger learning lesson in this, yeah. actually. Well, it's like, it goes that both ways, sense. right? So, it goes both ways, yeah. but that was a surprise to me, is yeah. how many people were saying, you know, I, I just trust, like, and it was the tonality of the advertising, everything. Um, and 
ever since then, I certainly put ever more effort into that element. Um, the credibility, the trust, um, I call it a, uh, a BLT sandwich that you want, um, belief, like, and trust, um, and injecting that into your, your advertising as much as possible. Um, mm -hmm. So, And a lot of that comes to tonality as well, the way you word things, the, the language you use, um, admitting things about yourself that are very personal in nature, mm -hmm. um, showing care for people, um, empathy, um, injecting, you know, thinking strategically about all the stories that you use in there for, for everything that will convey empathy and, and trust mm -hmm. is very key. Yeah. 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 No, thanks for sharing that. That is, that, again, <clears throat> that wouldn't be the first thing I think of, but it's so powerful. What about campaigns that didn't work and why when you assessed it, looking back, it didn't work? Because even <laughs> Hall of Famers are, you know, Hall of Fame baseball players, you know, are don't get a hit 70% of the time. Absolutely. Um, big secret to that is picking wisely. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, look, I'll go, I'll go over a few things with you about failures. Okay. Um, number one is there's a, there's a saying, um, prescription uh, without diagnosis is malpractice. Um, when I, after Gary, I kind of put myself out there as a copywriter initially, and I took copywriting jobs. And even though I'm a marketing strategist at the same time, which is, you know, the same, you know, skill that I put in the same amount of effort into, I ignored that part of me and just took copywriting jobs. Um, and that's a very big mistake. Um, I've learned very quickly when people come to you and say, hey, I've got this, will you optimize it? And you just go, sure. Um, that's not the proper approach. The proper approach is, I mean, these days, I will take an entire day, um, like full consult with someone before I discuss anything about what to do in their business because I need to understand everything in their business first. I need to see where the opportunities are, where they're not, um, et cetera. Um, and there's a lot of things that can go wrong if you just take a project. Um, there's a lot of information you don't have if you just take a project. Um, and when I switched to becoming a doctor and being a strategist first and a copywriter second, um, it changed the game because now I was picking what to do mm -hmm. rather than being told what to do and I'd be able to pick what has the best shot of working. I think most of my failures and, and my success rate is pretty good. Um, it's very high up there. I mean, I don't, I don't know numbers, but it's uh, when I fail, it's usually when I'm taking risks and I know I'm taking risks and the other people involved know that I'm taking risks. Um, and certainly there are times where I am confident someone will work and that fails too. But that's become a lot rarer because I choose very wisely. Mm -hmm. um, so it comes to that. Um, that's one. Um, number two, um, let's see what else. Um, in terms of campaigns, my bigger problem has actually been what I would call good growth versus bad growth. So, you know, I've been involved in a lot of campaigns that scaled very, very big, very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's very exciting. Um, however, yeah. <laughs> at the same time, yeah. that, that could really be hell at the very same time if you don't have proper management and systems and processes yeah. in place. And I have seen, I mean, I could go, I could tell you disaster story after disaster story of what can go wrong when you scale to really high mm -hmm. volume in a business and don't have the foundation set properly. Um, so early on, um, I've made a number of mistakes there of, uh, you know, these days I make sure that if I'm working with someone, that's there. I see. Um, so it's not so much your mistake, but you make sure it's in place. 
But you see, it's my mistake if I'm not on top of it and I'm not guiding my client to. And that's the difference of like, you know, I no longer, now I mentor and coach and strategist and mm -hmm. I'm able to. And it is a mistake because if you're a copywriter and you're allowing variables to create havoc, mm -hmm. then, you know, I think that is a mistake. So right. I view that as my mistake, not the client's mistake. It's the right. client's mistake if, if they're not following through, you know, right. and even as much as I'm on top and they're lying to me about not following through. But... I view that as my mistake. Yeah, yeah. So what have you seen? You said you have story after story of... Oh, um, well, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things that can, that can go wrong. Um, so from all sorts of avenues. So for example, where you're doing high volume online and you have any kind of tech problem, um, your website goes down or gets hacked, uh, your CRM has a problem, any kind of glitch. When you're dealing with very high volume of orders and you're paying a lot of money for traffic, whether it's paid or you know, you've know you got affiliates who send you orders and different fill or whatever it is, you could quickly lose a lot of money um, when that kind of stuff happens um, very quickly. Especially if but yeah, I don't want to, I'll just give you a bunch of different scenarios. We're going to go into details of them. Um, product supply issues. You know, you you think that uh, everything is fine, and then for some reason something happens, and now you've got all these orders and no product. Um, big problem. Um, you know, big problem customer service wise. Big problem merchant account wise. Big problem you know etc. Wise. Um, even when you're playing things safely with merchant accounts, um, I have seen merchant accounts steal money. Um, and I'm talking about seven figures. Just steal it. Um, gone. Poof. Um, what do you mean merchant accounts <laughs> steal money? You, the actual merchant, the people yeah, who... The actual, yeah, the people that are processing your money. Um, I've seen situations before dealing with wow. people. Or it just Yeah. Um, there are, unfortunately, bad business people and all... Scenarios as well as good, um, and that may be an exception to the rule, but I've seen it happen. Unfortunately, um, oh. I've seen all sorts of things happen. Um, you know, and uh, but I'll, so look, there's a lot of things that are unpredictable in business, um, but there's a lot of things that are predictable, and you need your foundation set properly. And so, you know, these days, I I like to follow a a plan of scalability where everything is set like very well and properly. Um, because a lot of people, a mistake that a lot of people have too, especially in direct response, is they're campaign driven rather than business driven. Um, and campaigns die eventually, you know, they're not a real business. Um, so that's one, one thing that I try to move a lot of people away from if, if they're that type of person, as well as a lot of people are direct response driven as as opposed to direct response branding driven. Um, I have moved in the last few years very heavily into the, what I call direct response branding as opposed to direct response um, because unless you're building a real business and a real brand and a real asset, then what do you really have at the end of the day? Um, but all that takes a lot of work because it's very easy to... I shouldn't say it's easy. If you know what you're doing, you have the right team, you could like do very well running campaigns in high volume. But unless you have the proper structure, that's all temporary. Mm -hmm. So Sam, when I was talking to Craig Clemens, he says, you need to ask him this question. Mm -hmm. And he says, give us one, ask Sam, give us one secret for optimizing customer value on each step of initial sale, upsell, follow up. Ooh. So um, it's a big question, but any any part of it that you want to address? <clears throat> um, well, for why I, I think I I just addressed it there um, in terms of um, speaking to your customers yeah. and get from them what needs to be changed in there. I, I essentially the only way I could answer that in a broad way is with that kind of response because it is about knowing what they want. Um, mm -hmm. And it's about testing a lot of things and having a proper structure to testing. Um, so split testing is a whole topic that a lot of people, um, much easier offline to split test, but extremely slow compared to online. I got addicted to online um, largely because of the speed at which you could test things. Um, 
the mistakes that people make are number one, interpretation of results, um, interpreting things too soon. Uh, there's all sorts of errors that even sophisticated people make. Um, I've learned that the hard way um, over time. Um, and number two, it's about, you know, because you have so many variables to test, it's about really being good at what do I need to test first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. And that comes down to determining what are, you know, what is it that a person is thinking at each step of the process? Um, and what is it that they want most? And really, as best as you can, through talking to people, through mm -hmm. seeing what everyone else is doing, coming up with a really good testing schedule for those things. And not testing copy first. Here's a big mistake people make, too. Um, testing the overall concept first. Um, you know, and then working to improve copy. Um, but I'd rather test if I have, like, if I think, well, there's probably three hot buttons or three things that work really well, I'll quickly, like, test those three concepts and see what's happening um, and then take it from there. But it, it really comes down to research and insight. That's that's where the secret is, Jeremy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Sam, since it's Inspired Insider, I always ask, tell me about your lowest moment and then how you pushed forward through that tough time. Hmm. Lowest moment. Yeah. Um, you know, the answer I'm going to give you is going to surprise you. Um, Probably. Because when I look back at a lot of things, I, thank God, knock on wood, have not had anything extremely devastating happen to me. Um, compared to a lot of people I know who, you know, uh, have had a lot of devastating hap devastating things happen, because that's life, unfortunately. Um, you know, but certainly I have what I view as common things. I mean, I've been, you know, in business. I've had, you know, I've went up and I've went down very quickly, you know, um, and I, you know, and for lots of reasons, including being cheated out of deals and all sorts of things. I mean, you know, but that's to me, ah, okay. You know, I've had heartbreak. I've had all sorts of things. I think I rebound very quickly from setbacks because I know that I'm able to recover and I have this mentality of, of just being able to recover. Um, here's where I would say I, you know, was probably the most difficult, um, is when I was actually, so that first campaign, I remember, um, that hundred million dollar campaign, um, <clears throat> I started making, and that was right after Gary. So, you know, um, I went from, you know, my experience with Gary was a high, then he passed away. That was a very big low, by the way, yeah. because, um, he was my mentor that was unexpected you know, he was my, became my best friend at the time, um, you know, and he passed away out of the blue. And on top of like losing, you know, him, um, all my money was also tied up with him. Um, so we had all sorts of projects and I kept my money with his money. So there was no way to differentiate my money from his money. So I lost all my money um, in that process. I also, his apartment um, ended up being locked up. I actually went away for Passover um, at that point in time. That he, Yeah, he passed away. It was on Passover. I went to New York to visit my family for Passover. Um, and I couldn't get my stuff from his apartment for quite a while. Mm. So, you know, I lost like, you know, Gary. A triple I lost, threat. Like, Horrible, like, yeah. Like, all my stuff, I lost like my money, like everything, and I was like, "This is not good." You know, I I got to start from scratch. But you know what? You know, I'll figure it out. I'll get some clients now, and uh, and that's fine. So it wasn't. It was a big. Him passing away was a real setback. Everything else was whatever. Yeah. Um, and then I quickly got into you know making money again and making really great money, and I started making like a lot more money than most people at my age at that time would be making. I was in my I don't know early 20s, like early mid 20s. And you, you know, I thought to myself that I would be very happy at this point in my life, like making all this money. Um, total time freedom, could do what I want, um, just traveling all over the place, having a great time. And yet, while I'm making all this money, I, and I was, I was happy, but at the same time, 
I was very miserable inside. Hmm. Uh, and I was miserable for quite a while um, inside. And I think that was probably the most difficult thing for me. And I'll tell you why. Um, I realized in this process that, number one, I expected that money would make me happy and fix everything. And it didn't. Um, and what I realized was that I was doing everything that I'm doing for money. Essentially, I was playing the game for money. And it quickly dawned upon me that I have a very big problem with that, that my focus is totally off from where it needs to be. Um, because, you know, money is not fulfillment in itself. Um, and I realized that my focus has to be on, on the value that I'm providing to people. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, I came into what I would call an existential crisis for quite a while in trying to figure out what I need to do with myself. Being that I have this skill, um, you know, and I have this power, so to speak, um, to make a lot of money um, creating businesses um, in this way, what should I do with that? Um, and I was probably more miserable from that internal struggle hmm. over the course of a few years to figure that out than anything else I ever experienced in my life. And that may seem strange because you would think that there's plenty of other things that would be far more difficult on you, but that was actually the most difficult thing for me, hmm. um, very frankly, because that everything else I learned to like deal with that I just you know that was just very tough. It was that internal yeah. struggle. Yeah, that internal struggle, you know, of of thinking, well, I'm here, you know, shouldn't I be happy? And yet I'm not. And like, what am I missing? And going on that path to find that now. Um, I yeah, that was. So yeah. how did you find it? Um, it took a good few years um, to to find you know the path that I wanted to go on. I mean, the immediate shift I knew I need to make is I need to be working on things from a value perspective as opposed to the money. The money should just be a side benefit. Versus mm -hmm. I came in all about the money because I needed the money. You know, um, so I had to switch my thinking. I knew automatically to just value money will come because I know how to make it. But then after I made that shift, the question started becoming, where do I need to focus my attention to best? Yeah. Um, and, and it, you know, it, it kind of put me in the path. It, it, of continual improvement, I'd say, in many ways that I am on today uh, in that process. And I have a lot of things that I have determined I would like to do um, in a big way um, down the line here in my future. Um, and I'm moving, you know, towards to a number of things um, in, in a big way. Um, but it, it has become really figuring out where I could add the most value. And I have determined I could do it in, in a few different ways. Um, but it's taken many, many years. And I feel like it's an ongoing process that will never end. Um, as I keep reaching new milestones. Um, so now, for example, you know, health has become something important to me very much. Um, so I'm moving into, you know, doing a lot of health projects, um, you know, uh, as an example. Um, yeah. Yeah. Education is something that's very important to me, uh, which I plan to move into. And I've been building out a plan to, like, you know, to do that in that case. So yeah. it, it's that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, Sam, on the other side of it, what's been one of the most proud moments? Proud moments. Mm. Um, ah, that's an easier question. Um, so the first thing that just came to mind um, is I remember, and this is random because there's lots of proud moments, but it's yeah. what came to mind. I remember... Uh, being at a fundraising event one night um, and it was like a high-end fundraising event and uh, they had an auction and it was one of the first like really nice fundraising events I went to and I ended up um, they had an auction and I and I got my little brother who's into music a guitar uh, signed by by uh, like Mark Anthony and his band. It was Mark Anthony's uh, guitarist. And I remember being in the cab home, and I'm thinking, you know, this is like really cool. Like, uh, 
like I'm able to like go to fundraisers and like you know give charity and you know and come home and like surprise my little brother with like this thing like this is what like this is all really about you yeah. know it kind of was a moment of like hitting me there um yeah. and you know like another moment you know that comes to mind is like also like not long thereafter like i you know i took my little brother and my mom to like disney world you know and got i got like a massive suite for them it was beautiful and just all out and like being able to do that for my family yeah. especially in like my mid-20s was like i felt like i was blessed to be able to do that kind of stuff yeah. um and then, uh, like, you know, um, my brother Danny, another example, final one I'll give. Um, my brother Danny um, mentored under Jay Abraham, actually, for a year. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And uh, he came to me when he had the idea to do so. And he reached out to Jay. And Jay told him that he'll make the same offer that Gary made me, which was about $30,000 for, like, a mentorship. And so, but Danny didn't have the money, so I lent, like, Danny the money mm -hmm. um, to go and mentor under, like, Jay. And again, you know, it's an example, like, being able to do that kind of stuff and paying it forward and help people and, and yeah. you know, make people happy and, uh, and do that kind of stuff really is where my proudest moments probably are. Yeah. And, and the examples that come to mind off the bat. So, um, and being able to do them at such a young age has just been a blessing. Yeah. Yeah. Sam, this has been absolutely phenomenal. I really appreciate it. Where should we point people towards? I have one last question, but where should we point people towards, if anywhere? I mean, it's not like you're looking for any business or anything like that. Is there a particular site we should tell people to check out? The only site I have is, uh, is sammerkowitzgroup.com, so mm -hmm. you can certainly go there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What should we leave people with? I have so many more questions. Like I'm, I'm, which I'm going to hold back on. I'm curious. Your logo is really interesting to me. I figure there, you're very methodical in your thinking. I'm curious why you have a line with the crown on it. Um, I'm also curious about what are your top uh, business marketing and psychology books that you'd recommend. Um, but I'm just going to leave it up to you. What? Where should we? You, you, we talked a lot here. A lot of great advice. Great stories. What should we leave people with? Um, I could answer that stuff for you another time separately, Jeremy. I'm glad to do it or follow up sometime. But um, if I had to, you know, leave everyone with something, um, mm. which comes in a lead off with, I guess, where we were just at. Um, a lot of people, a lot of people, you know, ask a question, um, which is, "Am I worthy of this goal?" Um, hmm. You know, they have a goal they want to pursue, and they ask themselves, "Am I worthy of it? Mm -hmm. You know, am I able to accomplish this goal?" And I find that asking, "Am I worthy of this goal?" is just the very wrong question to be asking. Mm -hmm. um, the right question to be asking is, "Is this goal worthy of me?" And when you ask yourself, "Is this goal worthy of me?" Mm -hmm. that's a life-changing question. Um, it's a question that. It has changed the direction of my life and continues to do so when I re-ask it. Um, and it's, it's one that I'd certainly leave uh, as a piece of advice or something if, if, if that's what you wanted. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sam, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's been fantastic. Yeah, it has. Great talking, Jeremy. Uh, thanks for inviting me to do this. Um, the, it was fun. All that right. That was great. Thanks, yeah. Sam. Take care. Bye-bye.